Um, so I'm here to talk about data trusts. Um, data trusts are something that started as an exploration for me in response to a problem, which was that our current models, our infrastructure, our organizational infrastructure for managing and stewarding data in contested spaces is challenging at best and invisible or absent at worst. So I don't know how many of you are Doctor Who fans. Generally speaking, this will let me know how techie an audience is. So one, awesome. Um, this is just a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today. I want to start with data governance, what, what I mean when I say it. Uh, I want to talk about why the digital and, and kind of data environments are different to other forms of, of market regulation or management. Uh, spoilers, we'll talk about data trusts uh, and a little bit about where they come from, what they're for, um, and then we'll, we'll end with what, what next should look like. So data governance. Does anybody read the terms of service generally? <laughs> terms of service are, interestingly, probably some of the most globally controlling governance documentation produced today, right? It, over, overnight, federates internationally, works across municipality, across subject matter, and yet still is dense and opaque enough and difficult enough that we don't read them. How many of you incidentally read constitutions? This is how many lawyers are in the room. Okay, so one, one other, so there's two people in the room. Uh, cool. So uh, when we talk about data ethics, when we talk about data governance, we very often talk about what we want to see, right? We talk about bias. We talk about whether or not data is permissioned or consented. We talk about the dynamics. But we very rarely talk about the structures of those systems. And so what I focus on and the thing that I, I think data trust and, and data governance will wrestle with very proximately are what are the vehicles, what are the instrumentation and the tools that we can actually use to start building systems that do capture our trust and that we can start credibly investing in or continue credibly investing in. Of course, the problem is that so far our initial attempt has been through terms of service, right? And terms of service, as it turns out, were not how everybody learned about their rights. So this is, in many ways, the role of government. And good news, Davos is on it. Um, the G20's next theme will be on a global data rules order. Is anybody going to that? <laughs> anybody really excited about it? One? I just got like a consi three. Uh, consistent, hit growing, watch out, this bar graph. Uh, so data rules are going to be complicated right, at the international level for a whole bunch of reasons. But again, without getting into sort of the norms, I think it's important to talk about the structure of why data is different. Can anybody, can people see this? Is it legible? Great. So legibility and granularity are two of the major issues, right, is how we make data useful, the degree of detail. We're very good at data in, in general. We are very bad at articulating data at its smallest point in terms of ownership. So we understand that a song is a song, but we don't know how many notes into the song a song becomes a song, right? And data kind of applies that to everything. It's like, at what point does it become a unique thing modeled in data? Anyway, then there are lots of other aspects of this. I'm not gonna read the slide to you. Basically, the way in which data as an asset class behaves throws up a whole bunch of problems for institutional authority, which is where we situate consumer protection, privacy, and a number of the other things that people rely on as the kind of enforcer of value symmetry that builds the trust that so many people have been talking about today. So I'll end with, um, so, sorry, I'm not over with the presentation. So how, does the, how do these differences matter? One is big a asymmetries in the ecosystem that the structures of the way that we regulate markets are different. Does anybody here have the exquisite privilege of banking with Wells Fargo? Not a one, so now my hit rate's down. Okay, so this is an image of the Wells Fargo landing page. And what it demonstrates to you is how many single function things in just, just the login page in a bank have become single companies. Right? And this is true not only of banks, this is true of many, many other industries. It's this idea that single companies 
are now whole supply chains, or what we used to treat as single companies are now whole supply chains. And so the way that we regulate norms, the way that we establish duties, and the way that we build enforceable guarantees between companies is every bit as or more important as, as it's ever been, but every bit as or more important than an individual company's stance, right? If you're a company, you're one unit in the supply, you're one link in the supply chain, but the next unit might be a data broker who sells everybody out. And so all of a sudden, if you've made a promise to a user, you're on the hook for that promise. And we've seen that happen across data companies. And this is just that, right? That this idea that we will have to push and really pull the way that we protect our users and the way that we manage data and rights to access and use our data across a very different organizational and sort of unit architecture than we ever have in the past. I talk about this as supply chains, not a lot of, you know, this is, not everybody necessarily thinks in supply chains, but data markets sort of naturally move through uh, provenance, right? So consent, collection, transfer, storage, use, refinement, reuse, resale, et cetera, deletion maybe. Um, those, all of that life cycle is very similarly creating a whole bunch of organizations and businesses that live in this supply chain. And I think that some of the large international political scandals we've seen in digital spaces have been about what falls through the cracks in a, in a supply chain relationship. Or the challenges of enforcement in a supply chain relationship. Interestingly, Cambridge Analytica sent their confirmation of having deleted the data back to Facebook. Email sent, box checked, job done. At one laugh, I'm just, it's awesome. Uh, so, two, it's growing. Um, so the, the goal here is, is to say that our architecture, not only of, of, of how we build databases, but also how we build the relationships between organizations, determines whose rights are represented, how we enforce them, and whether or not those rights are things that we, in a sort of normative sense, care about, right? The EU has a very different set of normative frameworks to the US, which has a very different set of normative frameworks to China. And uh, CG is a, you all will know better than I do in many instances, but they've just published uh, a, a series of papers about the way in which the political philosophy of the, of the web is changing and how that's creating problems for harmonization. So in a slightly different way, we're still, we're not building the infrastructure, the contractual supply chain management infrastructure that enables us to enforce and, and hold single baselines or promises or norms of treatment together. And then you have a very different set of questions, which is like, what are the roles of different actors, right? We've heard, interestingly, people were talking about how you, how you do public-private, and what is the role of value symmetry? You know, is it, is it good enough to have built a better public service? Do you also need to give citizens their data back? Is there a real big belief that data portability is the thing that is going to adjust essentially oligo ol oligopolistic markets? And maybe, but, but a lot of that will come from how we essentially build oversight and enforcement of the things that we consider baselines into the supply chain architecture and the provenance of data. Said a slightly different way, we are, whether we mean to or not, building a political science around data. Now you may not think of yourself as a data governor, in which case I applaud you on your autocracy. But if you proactively invest in consultation about the way that you use data, then maybe you're just a plutocracy. And if you go in with large, broad-based consultation that at a granular level enables your stakeholders and customers and citizens to challenge your decisions, hold you accountable, adapt your rules over time, remove themselves from your consideration, and any number of other things, then congratulations, you should be here. <laughs> because there's a lot between where we are now and that as a system that I think most people experience. So I just want to talk really quickly about the idea of political science for data governance. And I, I think that, that 
it comes up for me because with data trust, I started talking about data trust and then immediately sort of trust for those of you that, well, I, uh, as they relate to data governance, will come back to representation. And representation will come back to what matters to the person who defines the data governance system. So in law, and this is um, something I'm very, I'm very excited about and would expect the one other person who, who's a lawyer to be excited about, law has about, these are all theories of representation in law, right? If, if your data is used to harm you, that harm becomes a way that you can hold someone accountable. If you make a lot of money based on data, how you distribute those resources is something that affords other people or yourself representation. If you are affected by the decision that data is used to make, you, you may be represented. If you own that data, you may be represented. But how do you balance those? Right? And how do you balance those at the data level, absent use case? I bring you data trusts. How many of you all know what this is? I just want to say this is an age-adjusting graph, uh, and I know, I know who they are. So <laughs> anyway, the idea here is that both data and trusts are intentionally flexible, difficult to manage and govern units that offer tremendous flexibility and at, at the very best, I think we should assume that we're going to end up in a sort of uneasy and skeptical and probably at times explosive relationship with each other. All of which is just to say that there are lots of very well-heeled criticisms of data trusts and that this is not a product that I am offering to sell anybody or that anyone should get immediately off the shelf. We're not, the enabling environment isn't there. Um, I made the brave choice of using a white font on a pastel image. So for those of you who can't read, I just wanted to present a little bit about the history of trusts and as a result, data trusts and why we kind of came to them. <laughs> trusts started in 1066 during the Norman invasion of the UK. Uh, they were a way for the conquering royalty <laughs> to assign land ownership and management to a series of other functionally feudal lords. So they have an auspicious history in empowering citizens. On the other hand, 10 feudal lords is 10 more people than one, one conquering lord. So much of a muchness. Over the sort of ensuing thousand years, we figured out a lot about how to manage assets in the public good. And as it turns out, our norms around how central we want power to be went through a couple of cycles of change. So the, the most obvious example of trust or the most readily available analogy of trust to most people is the community land trust. Land is tangible, communities are local, it makes a lot of sense. A group of people get together and they decide how their land should or should not be used for the, for the best value for the community. That started really easy. Does everybody feel like they know what land is? I think giggles are hand raises, and so we're just 100%. One of the things that's fascinating about land is that you probably don't. Uh, or at least what you think land is now is very different to what people thought land was 100 years ago. And that's because we now have to think about things like the air above the land and the mining rights underneath the land and the concessions or temporary easements or bailments that we might afford to pieces of our land or the resources that we get through it. All of which is to say that as the environment evolved around the idea of land, so too did the way that we built legal instruments to start protecting and articulating what those relationships can and should look like. The same thing I think is really happening with data right now. Trust became a very important and valuable way to manage that. Maybe, maybe intentionally, maybe just because a group of people realized that that legal set of tools existed and co-opted them because they had previously been used to protect dynastic wealth. Um, these days, at least in the United States, we have billions of dollars of land held in, in community trust. That's true not only in the United States, but it is also true kind of anywhere where there's common law jurisdiction. There are millions of jobs created, but it is this idea that the relationship to the land, the relationship to the process has not only deepened our understanding of how to manage land, it's deepened the capacity of communities to engage with it in a very clear, granular, mechanical, and, and ongoing, sort of adaptable way. So a, a, a trust is these five things. A grantor puts an asset into a trust which gives control or some set of control over that. 
uh, to a trustee for a purpose on behalf of a beneficiary. How many of you are trust lawyers? Zero, zero, oh, all right, back down. Um, so, so all of these terms are contested spaces, right? In an environment in which we don't all agree whether data is or is not property, or whether or not the rights to use data in a particular context are a speculative asset, a real asset, or pretend, uh, understanding what an asset means in this context is something of a political assertion. Same thing with beneficiary definition. That's articulating who you work for or who a trustee should work for. So all of this is to say that none of this is settled practice, but that this is 1,000-year-old way, 1,000-year-old legal foundation on which we might build and adapt a few more tools to build more effective data governance. So why trusts? Um, I should say, and I jumped over this and I apologize, I mean trusts in the legal and contractual way. There are a lot of jurisdictions that recognize trusts as nonprofits or charities or, you know, and then there are a lot of other like markets and ways in which the term trust is used. I, I think those are great. Again, I have confessed to being a lawyer and so this is what I mean. And, Trusts are interesting because they, they act as much like powers of attorney as they do like organizations, in the sense of they are delegated rights. And initially, that's really uncomfortable until you realize that pretty much all of the way that technology licensing is used is essentially based on delegated rights. So if you're a big technology company, you may or may not have to answer the question of whether or not you own data, but you certainly know whether or not you have the right to use it and how you commoditize that right. Anyway, so it's not, it's not just an organization, or it's not an organization necessarily. Data sharing is something some people are interested in, as it turns out. And so it is aligned in many ways with the market. It's aligned with the things that we need to happen as a legal infrastructure, as a market infrastructure, not necessarily on a specific pace, but it's happening, right? And, and there are lots of interesting conversations about how far down into this we are. Um, two quick clarifications. One, fiduciary duties, um, again, very, the fiduciary duties are the way in which uh, we can hold people accountable for the promises that they make to us. They're just one way, but they're a very good way, and they come with things like duties of loyalty and care. So absent an explicit instruction, if someone is a fiduciary to you, they still have to hold your best interests at heart, even if you haven't said do A instead of B. They are also very contested. They are older, and so there are contractual ways to do it, and there are statutory ways to do it, and there's a really interesting kind of debate about what the best is. And I just want to say, lastly, the, the pluralization here. You know, we're talking a lot about the relationship between public institutions and private institutions. And, you know, nationalization is the public extreme end of that, and privatization is the total private side of that, and pluralization is a lot of at least as I use it as a term meant to say, like, this is where we define the authorities for private sector to play in a space. And so being a lawyer, the place where I look to this is alternative dispute resolution. If you've ever had a dispute with a landlord, if you've ever seen family law, there are a lot of mediators and arbitrators and people who are able to play a kind of quasi-legal role because the legal system has pluralized in, in, a, in this very sort of specific and limited way. So a couple of quick examples. Does anyone know Open Corporates? Two. Open Corporates is a nonprofit in the UK which holds beneficial ownership registries. They're a fantastic organization that is, has put their registry in trust. And the, the thinking there is that they want their registry to be market infrastructure. Right? They're not trying to win on having the best beneficial ownership registry. They're trying to encourage an ecosystem of people who will build products based on a knowledge of beneficial ownership or, or policy or any number of other things, but people who engage this way. They are one of the first nonprofits to go, to go in and build a trust directly. Then there's advocacy, and I think that this is something to talk about. A lot of, a lot of governance, obviously, is advocacy. But data advocacy is specifically undefined. Has anyone heard of the Black Lives Matter movement? I just, just stopped taking polls, shouldn't I? I'm sorry. There's an end on a successful note. Lots of people seem to know. So there's a data footprint created by any campaign, right? And that creates a threat surface and a value surface. 
the same as it does in any, any data transaction. The Black Lives Matter movement was very early in the advocacy space to recognize that they needed to have some agency attached to that data footprint in order to ensure that they were able to meet their goals, or they're able to meet their goals. And so they're agitating for a public data trust for the Black Lives Matter movement. Data trusts as defensive mechanisms are substantially less articulated than as resource sharing and building mechanisms. We don't, anyway. Uh, the offensive and the defensive sides of this are not developed in the same way. Some of you may have heard of the United Kingdom. It's a, it's a little island that's fallen on tough times, but before they did, uh, they decided to invest a billion pounds in artificial intelligence, um, and they recommended using data trusts as a sort of public engagement and governing mechanism to support that rollout, to, to embed public governance and oversight into the data into the provenance of data that would be used for, for publicly invested in and publicly important algorithms and, and AI investments. So those are just three quick examples. There are many more, but it is early days. Um, so the unanswered questions to completely copy the, <laughs> my predecessor is the enabling environment. It's how do we talk about what are the issues that we need to solve in order to stop talking about you know, what mechanism we use and start getting into what are the, what are the issues that we, that we need to answer in order to, to let people experiment and share data and build interesting things and drive the kind of economic development and citizen participation that we think is really important. Um, again, these are, are they're, this is a, <laughs> it's a lawyer nerd list, but the one that I wanna point to most is um, the comparative legal framework adoption and, and the value or importance of harmonization. So there's a lot of obvious political science debate about whether or not new regulations favor incumbents and essentially how big a rule needs to be in order to justify the operational expenses involved in being compliant with it. In other words, if it's really onerous, like GDPR, Right? Some, some companies may decide not to operate in that, bit, in that market. Smaller companies may struggle or take longer to get up to speed. And bigger companies may also leave your market, but they also you know, will have some advantage in, in the fact that they have the disposable capital to build as much compliance architecture as exists. Harmonization, like supply chain governance, is sort of how we look at the prevalent, like how enforceable pro public and private laws will, will be, or private standards and public law. And so understanding how we harmonize and how we build connections between those jurisdictions or between actors in a supply chain is of fundamental importance to ensuring that this unbundling and supply chain driven market is able to achieve kind of public interest goals. Um, I have to assume that I'm not looking in the right place for where I should be getting off stage. So there are, great, I should be getting off stage. So um, a lot of these, the, I, I'm gonna lie to you and say the pluralization and privatization, the one up is like devolution and decentralization. That's a, this is the last one. Devolution is this idea that units have to fit into a common architecture. The governance folks of you will probably know devolution quite well and for the technology people, you know, it's about, architecture federation generally, right? How do, you how do you devolve authorities and permissions and then how do you federate them so you ensure that people are able to represent themselves autonomously but then able to aggregate that representation into ways that affect the rules of the whole ecosystem. A lot of this debate has, been talk has talked about decentralization like the municipal unit or the platform unit. But those are, decentralization doesn't offer the same <coughs> guarantees of equity or the same framework in which we all have to kind of hang this, our practice. And it's, it's agreeing a devolution framework in a lot of instances, or even a public-private sort of pluralization architecture that so much of the kind of contracting and, and data trust world is defined around. Data trust right now are very often articulated as a way to sort of build reliability in extremely uncertain regulatory times, right? That if we can ensure, if we can hold the accountable, then maybe we don't have to wait for government action, or at least we don't have to be, be contingent on it. Um, how those things play out 
will determine quite a bit about the amount of rights that we have in any digital space, in any digital supply chain, and in any governance framework that we hope to represent our interests in whatever we define as public or good. So I will, that, that, civic data trusts. Civic data trusts are the, the addition of a governance layer into the idea of a trust. So um, whereas a single trustee may have managed your relationships, now a, gover a, a, a community council or a group of people who represent your constituent interests might do that. Questions? Usual polling rate? Thanks so much, Sean, for, for the talk. And even if you couldn't hear, I did chuckle at least two times. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the comment that the gentleman from uh, Smart Waterloo Region made about his, uh, their stakeholders not wanting to use the term data trust, and I think he said data collective was what they went with. In your experience, um, and I'm not, I'm not sure exactly the nature of your work with Digital Public, who your clients are, who you see, and talk to, that kind of thing, but could you speak to what you think are uh, obviously, the benefits to this are very clear, right, as, as a strong framework and mechanism, but is there a gap there between the willingness of organizations, individual actors, or groups, or whatever it might be, to adopt this kind of thing? And if there is, how do you close it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, uh, I, generally speaking, what we see is that there's a lot of confusion between the legal mechanism and the, gover and the governance design of that legal mechanism. And absent sort of like a deep review or a certification, what we tend to do is look at the words. And so a data cooperative or a, a collective or something that we, you know, that connotates a communal power relationship is, a, is indicative of a governance authority of an agency of a rights framework that I think a lot of people very understandably want. Um, it's very different conversation to what the best legal sort of framing or the, the infrastructure on which to build those governance models is. And I think it varies by context. Um, I think the folks at Mars have done a, a helpful job of comparatively focus grouping a couple of the terms. And, um, you know, I think, I don't even think, I think, was it trust? Or what was the term that won the most public approval? Sorry? Data plus? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the winning focus group answer was civic digital trust, uh, and it includes data plus algorithms, confusingly not including code, um, but here we are. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and when we first started, it was digital was the term that we used too, uh, but as it turns out, specificity is a, is a value in, on, in and of itself. Um, so I, you know, there's no like top level thing. I think we have a lot to do in terms of setting standards for what some of these things mean so that we have more reliable foundations for our expectations. And I think, you know, it's, it is extra, it's almost impossible to overstate how much I think investment, and I mean, I don't mean strictly financial, in capacity and understanding is critical to defining the space if we're going to get to popularity or meaningful sort of Edelman style trust of any type. Oh, is there time for one more question? One more? No. Uh, hi everybody, Anders McKenzie, Sean, fantastic presentation. I'm a partner at Deloitte locally here. Um, as nascent as these data trusts are, have you seen examples in the, in the corporate realm where people are monetizing these, these data trusts? In a way, so how do you make money at the state of trust? Yeah. I've got a, a number of clients that are interested in that space. Uh, I don't know if everyone could hear that. That was, um, how do we monetize the practice of data trusts? In a way, from Deloitte. Um, <laughs> well, sir. Um, no, it's, you know, monetization has become a really interesting question, and the relationship between money and credible governance is something that I think comes up in lots of circles. So uh, there's no, I don't think that there's a, if you just write it this way, or if we just only use it for this type of data relationship, we clearly start with a value proposition. Where we have seen is that there are a lot of ways in which ambiguous regulatory environments, escal escalating liabilities, and evolvingly digital markets. So natural resource production, for example. Lots of folks 
lots of data that needs to change hands for regulatory purposes. There's a new group of organizations kind of stepping into that space to be platforms for that, and the capture around data is a very interesting issue. Um, there's, there's room for people who are able to experiment around what either reducing liability looks like or proactively kind of building community value. But I think that the, the urge to monetization, while understandable from a sustainability and profitability perspective, is a, it's, it's, it will be a slow driver here, I think. And I think that where you see it be a quick driver will be in places where people try and use data trusts as a way to suggest that they don't have to comply with national legislation, which is an exciting stance that I think will probably play out. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>